you share data where data needs to be shared in a easy, trusted, and frictionless manner. When you work in silos, right? And let's let's just be honest. Um, so much of, of of the systems that we work in and in the environments that we work in day in day out are, are siloed, right? So our maintenance information system, you know, is a is is one such silo. You know, our ERP is another such silo. Um, you know, the the records and records of 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 you know, the history of an aircraft and its parts in paper records, in banker's boxes, stored in an iron mountain vault or in the back of a maintenance hangar. You know, those are those are other silos. And when we're trying to digitize and connect data um, in a siloed environment, we run into the problem of being able to validate that that the data that we have is actually correct, um, which is critical when we're operating in a safety critical environment in a safety critical enterprise. All right. So for instance, and you know, we talk about digitizing records. And the way you have to digitize records is you have to scan and OCR them. There's no other way around that. Right. And let's be honest about OCR. OCR is OCR. It's mature, it's commoditized, certainly it's inexpensive. But it, it's not going to get you know better or worse. And when you have particularly a lot of handwritten documents and you're just scanning them in and you're you're um, you know just depending upon an automated process to say okay you know this uh, this uh, round uh, you know, shape in the serial number is that a zero or an O right is that a one or an L or an I. Uh, you know, there's no way to be certain that the OCR software you might use gets that right. So, so how do you validate data uh, without actually having to take the part off the plane and look at the serial number? It's one of the things that that uh, data ecosystems and uh, easy ways to share data uh, and validate data in a centralized, uh, although I'll be a distributed ecosystem at an industry level, um, allows you to fix, allows you to automate. Um, but in order to create uh, uh, an easy, frictionless environment for sharing data, what we call a data exchange, uh, we have to solve for data governance. Uh, next slide, please. So how have we begun to solve at the industry level for data governance? Um, you can have lots of different data exchanges. You could have lots of different methodologies, platforms, ecosystems to do parts track and trace or records management or asset management. Um, but when we consider that the life cycle of parts uh, touches many actors and many organizations, um, and that we consider that the life cycle of aircraft similarly touches many actors and many organizations, um, you want to be able to get a broad tent set up for the industry to say, okay, well, you know, here's how we're going to solve for data governance. Just, just the same way, for instance, that the industry says, okay, we have spec uh, 2000 and, 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 and 2500 as data portability standards for maintenance data and for records. It's pretty much universal. Uh, the same way the industry has in the engineering domain standards for uh, safety assurance processes for software and hardware for things like FADEX and avionics components. We want to have a single industry standard for data governance. Um, so to that end, uh, what we've done uh, working with IATA and other industry organizations is we created a new consortium. It's called IDCA, our Independent Data Consortium for Aviation. Next slide. And uh, really what, what IDCA is here to do is bring uh, all stakeholders in an MRO supply chain together uh, as equals under one roof uh, in a pre-competitive environment um, and uh, solve for data government. So it's, it's, it's to say, okay, right, um, what are the use cases for which we all need to share data with each other that add value to all? Uh, and then in each use case, what are the conflicts of interest? So, for instance, what does it mean if I'm sharing data as one airline to another airline? Um, how can that airline use that data against me? Or similarly, uh, if I'm uh, an airline sharing data with an airframer, uh, how can I be assured that that airframer isn't going to use that data I, I share with them uh, against me in arguing a warranty position, for instance? So we, we, we want to then map, okay, for each of the use cases we agree uh, require data sharing for us to uh, achieve value and digitization at scale. What are the conflicts of interest that today uh, prevent us from frictionlessly easily sharing that data? And then uh, for each conflict of interest, 
right? Having done that mapping, we say, okay, you know, what are the tools and strategies at our disposal for mitigating those conflicts of interest? So for instance, um, for, for blockchain-based track and trace solutions, of which there are several in the industry now emerging, um, how would you implement uh, uh, redaction controls for certain data, obfuscation controls, critically very fine-grained access and authentication controls in something like a smart contracts layer, right, in the blockchain. Um, how do you design interfaces that allow for uh, sharing data in certain ways where uh, the owners or originators of that data have control over who sees that data, when, how, and where, and critically under what use cases. Um, these are questions that IDCA is poised to answer. Um, and then you know, I'll, I'll, I'll ask or answer the question, why, why IDCA? Uh, why are uh, we looking at creating a new consortium versus leveraging an, in, uh, an existing industry trade association like IATA, for instance, or like uh, AIA or GFAS uh, on the manufacturing side. And it really comes down to uh, when we look at the different types of stakeholders that have a role to play in the MRO community, um, we understand that, okay, you have airlines, you have MRO, right, facilities, independent and airline owned, component repair stations. You have the airframers and the engine makers, critically also the tier one OEMs. All of these folks have a role to play. You have distributors, you have technology providers. There isn't today one uh, nonprofit trade association. There isn't one international association that brings together uh, all of these different types of stakeholders uh, as equal members and as equal owners uh, in, 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 in taking a stakehold in this landscape. Um, so this is why we've created a new organization that can be owned uh, and supported by, in equal fashion, all of the different stakeholder types, all of the different types of stakeholder organizations uh, that serve this space. Next slide. So again, you know, what IDCA uh, will enable is a common platform for data governance, uh, a means to implement data governance in different technical systems. Uh, there will be uh, uh, right now a focus on uh, data sharing use cases around transactional maintenance information and what we'd call forensics or part pedigree information. But into the future, um, we can see IDCA playing a critical role um, creating and solving for problems around how do you create uh, advanced uh, uh, combined data exchanges uh, where uh, different stakeholders in the industry can freely uh, bring data together for all sorts of new types of technologies and activities uh, perhaps that we haven't thought of yet. Like for instance, how do we create um, artificial intelligence models uh, either for prognostics or for route planning um, or for or for uh, uh, fuel optimization that just um, uh, aren't based off one airline set of data but can combine uh, sets of data by different airlines without any actor in that program being able to see gain or or leverage uh, competitive information or trade secrets. Um, there's a sort of an early stage example of this right now uh, in an, in an R&D capacity being led by Eurocontrol in Europe, uh, who is working to bring uh, flight path navigation data from different airlines together uh, in a blockchain uh, where, where sensitive information is kept hidden away. Um, but where information that can be shared is shared to create a blanket AI model to optimize flight paths in what is a very, very crowded uh, and, and let's say com complicated, complex airspace. Um, and, and IDCA will, will, will grow over time to um, look at all sorts of use cases that, that are across commercial aviation that can leverage existing plus emerging technologies where data sharing is paramount. Next step, next slide. So IDCA's org structure is, a, is as follows. Um, uh, uh, this is a brand new organization. Um, you're getting, in fact, a little bit of a sneak peek 
uh, about uh, what this is. Um, its public launch is going to be in January of 2023. Uh, over the summer, a board of directors was elected, uh, including senior leadership from firms like Airbus, uh, and Collins, uh, Safran, Parker, Air France, Calum, and others. Um, and we have in the organization building the charter uh, and building the structure, uh, a number of airframers, engine makers, tier ones, and a number of global airlines. Um, also, we have a couple of independent MROs. Um, so this is an organization that's gotten very little uh, publicity or, or even attention to date but already has a critical mass of industry support, which we're very, very excited about. Um, the committee will operate, uh, or the organization, I should say, shall, will, will, will operate um, with a leadership council that will direct the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, activities of the organization, as well as set the roadmap for policymaking. Um, so the board of directors is really focused on the health and the vibrancy and the longevity and thrivability of this uh, new consortium, uh, this new organization, whereas the council, uh, the leadership council, uh, is it really responsible for setting the vision and the execution for data governance and the policy itself. Um, and then, and then the different aspects of data governance, um, you know, different different interests, uh, different parts, different sections, uh, will be run by different standing committees, each of which will have chairs um, that can uh, uh, serve uh, the uh, the broader organization, which we'd call a general body. Um, like uh, standards committees, uh, this is going to be. Uh, largely a volunteer effort. The organization, as as it begins to collect dues next year, uh, will build uh, to have a full-time staff uh, to administer consortium activities, uh, to staff and run meetings. There'll be, of course, critically a legal department. Um, but a lot of the, the 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 heavy lifting, so to speak, will be done by industry volunteers. Um, so it, it, to create thriving organizations where we understand um, a lot of the work product is going to be volunteers uh, and volunteers time. Um, what we've designed for is an organization that brings in a lot of leadership um, because you want to have a lot of leadership opportunities, but also distributes that leadership requirement and role across many different people. Um, that way you're not really relying on four or five committed people uh, to carry uh, the, the the staff forward, so to speak, when one of those, uh, when two or three of those four or five people get very busy, for instance, it can be very hard for business to continue. Um, so we create a, a broad tent uh, of leadership, and then and then an even broader tent uh, for participation, so that this committee will have a critical mass to carry its important work forward as. You know, individuals get busy at certain times. Next, next slide. So I'll go very quickly through an example of of what uh, this organization will help facilitate. Um, we'll talk a little bit about parts track and trace, um, and and how that is an important foundation for creating a federated view of the life of an aircraft, um, for solving for siloed information and siloed systems. Next slide, please. I'll hurry it along a bit. Um, one, one. Thank you. This is great. So, what, uh, what, uh, you know, what, what, what this is, what, what's being built um, in conjunction with with IDCA um, to implement IDCA policies, is a platform, a blockchain data network platform uh, that will implement the consortium governance in such a way where consortium governance will first focus on parts, track, and trace. Uh, and then that part track and trace functionality will serve as a federated validated data backbone or exoskeleton for then tracking aircraft configuration data. Um, and that gives a complete view, uh, when I say aircraft configuration data, by the way, I mean also engine configuration data or any complex assembly configuration data. So if you can track uh, an aircraft and its maintenance events, um, the configuration changes to that aircraft over time, starting with an ARC or an AIR and then going forward, um, plus, at any given time, know what parts are on and off that aircraft, and currently the maintenance history of, of all of those parts. 
you have a complete view to to do that full digitization, getting rid of paper and getting rid of the cost of paper that we're all interested in doing. Um, and what's what's really so very important, we go to the next slide, is that when you look at at, at the whole chain of the aircraft level, um, what what a parts track and trace solution will enable you to do. Uh, is provide a backbone for validating all of that information that today is on paper that you want to get off paper automatically, right? So for instance, as you begin to scan that paper, by having a parts track and trace solution serve as a foundation, you'll know, for instance, um, whether the information scanned from paper matches validated, uh, automatically verified and validated data um, that you have in your parts track and trace platform. Um, the parts track and trace data, even though that may come from maintenance information systems or ERP where it was originally typed in, right, from someone looking at paper, and of course there are human mistakes there, the way that information gets validated automatically um, is because as parts move through their life cycle and are touched by multiple actors where parts data such as the serial number, the manufacturing uh, date, cage code, et cetera, the part number, all that gets typed into different systems, you can then triangulate truth from uh, reading different systems reporting on that same part. Um, a parts track and trace solution will also be able to uh, tell uh, you know, airlines and their supply chain and their service chain around MRO uh, what parts are on what airlines, uh, airplanes when, and also critically when parts are taken off airplanes or put on airplanes, when that specifically happens, which enables airlines to begin to track cycle and hour actuals for LLPs and, and as necessary for other serialized parts. So creating what this is, frankly, it's the, it's the digital thread uh, for the parts um, that can then serve a validated backbone, a digital twin for an aircraft that will um, you know, uh, achieve our end goals for complete soup to nuts digitization, uh, which we believe will take ultimately $30 billion of cost out of the industry a year. But this only works with good data governance because the, the fact is, right, you know, as you have airlines shipping parts out to component repair, component repair, shipping parts back to airlines, when you have pools and then pool managers in the mix or PBH providers in the mix, when you have the OEMs in the mix, you, there's critical forensics data that has to be shared at the end of the, in the, excuse me, at the end of the day anyway. And by having a, a platform that ascribes to consensus built and consensus validated data governance, uh, now you can make that data sharing easy, click of the button easy, um, which which begins to now dramatically improve the volume of data being shared, creating an industry backbone that can then accelerate your digital transformation initiatives. Next slide. And uh, that's it. Um, so thank you very much and happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And uh, we appreciate your efforts here in this area. And uh, the questions, if you have any questions, please type them in and uh, we'll forward them to Mark and uh, all the other presenters and uh, you'll get a response. Our next uh, speaker uh, is uh, uh, Gareth uh, Harris. Uh, he's the product manager for IATA's MRO Smart Hub uh, product. Uh, he has been working uh, for a, a number of years uh, with various high-tech industries and the last 15 years he has spent his time with uh, within aviation and aerospace uh, in various positions uh, the last uh, ones before joining IATA was with uh, Avios, Avios, Avios fleet performance and uh, with uh, Air Canada maintenance so he has significant experience uh, within the MRO and airline maintenance and environments and he has helped us to uh, develop and manage the MRO uh, Smart Hub. So, Gareth, uh, please, it's all, all yours. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us for this presentation on MRO Smart Hub, uh, IATA's unique solution for valuing aircraft spare parts. I'm going to discuss IATA's role providing support for airlines and maintenance repair and overhaul service providers and go into some detail about how Moreau Smart Hub is becoming uh, an indispensable tool that can be used under any market conditions to generate tangible benefits for both airlines and MRO organizations. Next slide, please. 
IATA is an industry body whose mission is to represent, lead and serve the airline industry. Our vision is to work together with our members and partners to shape the future growth of a safe, secure and sustainable air transport industry that connects and enriches the world. Next slide. IATA's work is in three primary areas, uh, advocacy and lobbying, standard setting and adoption of products or services. Uh, in the area of products and services, our goal is to add value for our members and enhance air transport by providing services where we have a clear mandate and a distinctive capability. It's in this area that MRO Smart Up was developed based on some very specific needs that were being signaled by our airline partners. Next slide. IATA MRO Smart Hub is a web-based business intelligence platform with four key components. Evaluator, this provides fair market value and detailed statistics for surplus parts. Connector, which is a trading platform that simplifies relationships with your preferred partners by creating distinctive trading channels in a closed environment. Consignment, which allows you to manage multiple consignment inventories and determine preferred pricing. And finally, Auctioneer, a dynamic live auction environment with the added benefit of our evaluator functionalities. The platform allows for the quick and accurate evaluation of excess inventories and provides a transparent fair market value and true availability of surplus material. The primary benefits of utilizing the platform are to help reduce material cost while maximizing the usability of on-hand inventory. As well as allowing you to fully understand part valuations, the platform also gives you an opportunity to purchase, sell, exchange or auction aircraft materials, as well as allowing you to manage your consignment inventories. Whilst the platform is web-based, we also offer the opportunity to integrate key elements of the platform data within any ERP system or commonly used MRO tool. Next slide, please. The evaluator is a central reference for a surplus parts worth. This is commonly referred to in the industry as the FMV or fair market value. The evaluator fair market value cal calculation is built around the data contributions of our subscribers. Fundamentally, the endpoint transactional data related to their purchases, sales and repairs of aircraft spare parts. This is combined with available market data, as well as publicly available data around interchangeability, part life cycle and commonalities. This is all brought together to produce transactional statistics and algorithmically applicable data points. The FMV for parts is derived using a proprietary stage based algorithm and is not simply an average of historical prices. The platform delivers strategic insights and statistics with respect to all materials that are listed. The platform contains detailed baselines of past and average purchase prices, as well as the average repair costs and turnaround time, all based on part condition. It can provide guidance and reference points for sales and purchase prices, as well as marketability data via supply and demand statistics. It's a sophisticated business intelligence tool that can recommend the best course of action for your material needs. The tool can be used tactically on single parts as well as strategically for entire material packages, asset groups and fit lists. Next slide, please. Evaluator can address numerous business use cases. The primary use is to provide business intelligence in the area of purchasing and sales, but it can also inform critical decisions like repair versus replacement, where the necessary insights required to make an optimal decision are frequently not available. We carry an extensive database of parts and can provide information on potential lower cost alternatives that are available. Improvements in asset utilization can be easily addressed by use of the data in the platform, whether to keep an asset in inventory, send it to the repair cycle or release for surplus sale. Evaluator can provide appropriate benchmarking data. The platform has a powerful capability to evaluate entire packages of parts in a short space of time and provide granular part level results that can quickly inform strategic decision making. This can help to eliminate tedious, time-consuming and incomplete research efforts and focus resources into more critical operational areas. Our company benchmark feature allows you to accumulate and visualize potential savings based on a complete comparison between you, the data you provide and our fair market value database. This allows you to clearly identify where savings opportunities exist right down to the part number level. Next slide. There are currently over uh, 1 million unique parts with a fair market value listed in the evaluator database. The platform covers more than 100 aircraft types and engine models. And we also have a broad coverage for all standard material types and part conditions. Next slide. 
Connector is a trading platform that simplifies relationships with your preferred partners by creating distinctive trading channels in a closed environment. You can make material available to specific partners via trading channels that which are unique to your organization and only visible to the trading channel participants. There's full control over pricing by the use of pricing rules, which can be customized for each of your trading channel partners. Connector acts as a virtual extension of your warehouse with all available listings guaranteed to have a price, lead time and availability. This helps to eliminate ghost listings and improve transparency. The platform can be used as a standalone web-based application as well as having the possibility to seamlessly integrate with your existing ERP. The enough analytics available in our evaluator module are also fully integrated with Connector. Next slide. With more than 320,000 units listed and a combined value of $250 million, there's significant scope for trading on the platform. There are now more than 300 companies available for trading on MRO Smart Hub. Next slide. We're currently offering airlines free access to the connector platform until the end of March, 2023. And I've provided the registration details for the campaign here, uh, which you'll be able to access uh, after the event. Next slide. Assurance of data quality on the platform is a fundamental objective. By making price availability and lead time a mandatory requirement for parts listings, MRO Smart Hub can, has a significant advantage over other trading platforms. Only validated and trustworthy data helps to create reliable FMVs and ensures the functionality and validity of evaluator analytics and statistics. MRO Smart Hub employs a multi-stage process to ensure data quality. Data deliveries from clients are checked during the import process to ensure that technical data requirements are fulfilled for all data sets. Data does not include obvious ghost listings for connector. This is a problem that's plagued the wider industry and is problematic on other trading platforms. For evaluator, it's critical that data content is valid and trustworthy. Every user accepts the minimum data quality requirements by accepting the terms of use of the platform. Next slide, please. Within the platform, anonymity of client data is of great importance. All data is fully anonymized so that only the provider of those transactions can identify their own data points versus that of the rest of the community. The number of data providers is never visible, and if there are fewer data providers than a certain threshold, the data will not be shown. Raw data is not shown, only the resulting KPI. Raw data provided by clients isn't stored. The raw data is deleted after initial usage via scripts. All resulting data points and analytics are held securely and confidentially by IATA for the benefit of the MRO Smart Hub community. Next slide, please. Maintenance remains the third largest cost component of an airline's cost of operations after fuel and aircraft ownership. The cost of parts and materials is a significant proportion of this maintenance cost. MRO Smart Hub can help to release the value in surplus maintenance inventory, optimize cash generation by the resizing of inventory asset base to improve agility, provide improved control of asset evaluation and sales by providing unique information, and also enhance liquidity and significantly reduce costs. We estimate that the platform can generate a 10 to 15% reduction in material spend. For clients interested in understanding more about this, we can provide a more detailed ROI analysis for your organization based on your data inputs and the analysis the platform can provide. It's worth considering that MRO Smart Hub is capable of delivering these benefits regardless of the market or industry conditions. Next slide, please. MRO Smart Hub was developed based on very, some very specific needs that were being signaled by our airline partners. There's a clear requirement to improve the level of transparency surrounding the valuation, pricing and availability of spare parts. With a lack of available industry tools, there was no access to a neutral source of information against which airlines could transact and benchmark. The need for FMV intelligence directly linked to actual market transactions has never been stronger. IATA MRO Smart Hub offers unique market insights based on an algorithmic approach to developing fair market value for aircraft spare parts, as well as providing granular intelligence at the part number level based on part condition. The community-driven data contribution, also known as the give to get approach, enriches overall insights by providing benchmarking data for your organization. All transactional data contributions are anonymized and secure, 
and only subscribers can view their data points versus the marketplace. IATA remains a neutral service provider and can provide a safe, safe harbor for this essential data. MRO Smart Hub is a platform that can provide an unbiased viewpoint on the valuation for airlines, MROs, and aftermarket vendors alike, as well as utilizing the power of collective data contribution to create a truly unique picture of the marketplace for surplus spares. The next slide, please. This is a current list uh, of clients that IATA is working with to support the MRO Smart Hub platform. MRO Smart Hub operates based on a community approach that requires data contribution from all subscribers. Everyone benefits from this data collectively, whilst IATA operates a neutral safe harbor to anonymize and protect information on behalf of the community. Next slide, please. To register for a demonstration and to take advantage of our current offers to access the platform, you can visit the website listed here. Uh, you can also subscribe through our dedicated website to receive further updates about the platform. We have expanded on much of what you've heard uh, through a white paper, which is now available through the listed link. This draws on further insights directly from the uh, MRO Smart Hub data, detailing the full impacts of the COVID crisis on the market for use serviceable material. And we will be producing a revised analysis uh, based on the, uh, the data gathered since that time uh, in the new year. So if you have any further questions about the platform, you can contact us directly using the details listed below. And now we have a very special treat for you. Uh, we have two presenters from far away from us, at least. <laughs> it's uh, uh, two, uh, two subject matter experts on cybersecurity from uh, Air New Zealand. And uh, I would like to give a very special thumbs up to them because uh, it is now, if I'm not mistaken, almost four a.m. in the morning and they have been with us uh, since the beginning of this webinar so pretty much all the night they were up uh, just to deliver this presentation to you so i think you will feel very special about that and with that i would like to uh, uh invite to the floor our virtual floor uh to to SMEs from uh, from Air New Zealand, and uh, this is uh, Sean Harris. Uh, Sean has worked in cybersecurity for the past 12 years across a number of New Zealand financial institu institutions and uh, institute and, and a global credit firm. For the last three years, he has worked in the Air New Zealand cyber team, focusing specifically on cybersecurity uh, of the aircraft operations. And uh, Mike McMurray, Mike has worked in various roles at Air New Zealand for over 20 years, from supporting engineering maintenance systems through to architecting the ground systems for the 7879 delivery and now working in cybersecurity for the last two years. So uh, again, thank you guys for staying up. <laughs> uh, we appreciate your participation in today's webinar and the floor is yours. Great, thank you for that. Um, if you can just move to the next slide, please. Uh, kia ora all. Um, kia ora is a Maori greeting, wishing you good health and, and thank you, uh, Irina, for inviting us to speak today and thanks for those who are listening and watching as well. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Mike McMurray and I'm going to talk to you about some of the challenges we face with operations and cybersecurity at Air New Zealand and then Sean's going to cover our approach to overcoming these. So let's start with some background of the recent past and the cybersecurity challenges we see. So almost three years ago, and, and like everyone else on the call, of course, Air New Zealand was, was massively impacted by the pandemic and the way all of our staff work changed overnight, uh, effectively at the end of March 2020. So this essentially froze the airline, but there were urgent changes, of course, needed to keep some functions running and then to deal with the fallout. Many people were lost from the work workforce in operation and cybersecurity areas amongst all the others. We had challenges on what HR changes were happening with various staff groups on maintaining their access during furlough or removing their access. And of course, we didn't know that this was going to last for months or then turn into a multi-year effort. 
So New Zealand, like many in the world, went through a stop-start cycle during our lockdowns. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but this period of high change also triggered a change of thinking. And there was a clear and obvious desire for increased connectivity and automation to help keep the airline flying while also keeping our staff and passengers safe. And some activities to keep staff productive went from being vague project ideas before COVID to being actioned in a couple of weeks or less. Priorities during this time changed very, very quickly. Having so many different areas of the business come together daily and with a common goal of keeping the business alive created opportunities that allowed us to build or extend relationships with some critical partners inside our business. So in summary, we had plenty of challenges, but also a lot of opportunities. Next slide, please. Moving faster and being more agile to meet the changing world means we have a lot of new challenges. More and more technology, and partially driven from our staff and customers when they have mobile access in their personal lives. They also now see the benefits of having the same in their operational tasks at work. Changes in things like EFB are an obvious example of this. We now have very important information on a very portable device that can easily be lost or, or damaged. Vendors, we don't often buy a large suite of technology from a single vendor these days. So with more vendors, we've got more specific and integrated solutions, and we're exposed to the differences in how they operate and their own cybersecurity, or maybe lack of sometimes. Data, everyone wants to have the right information to make informed decisions on things like how fast can we turn an aircraft or analyzing engine data from the jet fleet. Part of our job is to ensure that information is secured and accessible to the right people and not the wrong people. When the data is used in decisions that can affect safety, how do we know to trust the data and that it hasn't been modified? While it does seem a little paranoid, the obvious potential impact of these threats is becoming of these threats becoming a reality is a, is a real major concern. Some of these decisions benefit from real-time data and decisions at speed. So there's a requirement to automate, to increase pace, and that sometimes has its own problems. We know computers will do what they're programmed to do, but maybe that's not always what we actually want them to do. People also have their own limitations on speed before we start to make mistakes and take shortcuts. More data, more speed, more connectivity. Aircraft connections to ground systems are important mechanisms the airline and operational teams benefit from, but it also creates new and possibly unexpected opportunities for access that we didn't have before. Mobile and wireless connections from aircraft often use shared communication and telco providers. And while this comes with greater security controls, they're also more visible to external parties these days. The sum of all these things is an increased number of risks, risks to, to operational processes and a challenge to cybersecurity teams on how to help, but also not to hinder while keeping the airline safe. Next slide, please. So we have this increasing amount of technology creating complexity in a different risk landscape. And when compared to things like a paper logbook or physical aircraft parts, things are very different. We knew the people who returned the log sheet or delivered the parts, we just trusted them. But those physical controls don't work with the ones and zeros that can be copied and easily changed for digital information. In terms of regulations, things were likely simpler in the past where it was more a case of the right people following the approved processes and you are on the path to compliance. As we've mentioned, mobile connectivity is now commonplace on the flight deck, in the cabin and under wing. Mobile apps are installed on iPads for flight crew, cabin crew and engineers. The aircraft, the aircraft configuration is managed by software on ground systems and they, connect to over, and they connect over wireless and mobile networks. We also need to have a view on vulnerabilities in this software and in these systems that can turn possible threats into realities overnight. 
these are things like software bugs that can be exploited in unexpected ways that could lead to unauthorized access or, or loss of data. As an example, the Java programming language had a vulnerability given the name Log4j in December 2021. And this meant almost everyone in cybersecurity globally was asking their software teams and their vendors, do we use this code and, and what if we do? And these are harder questions to answer than you might think. There's historically a different pace of software updates and aircraft systems compared to the normal laptops and desktops. We certainly recognize the need for reliability and robustness, but these operational systems are, are much more visible now and it's critical to keep them safe. When serious bugs appear, we need a way to either fix the issue or mitigate it so it becomes a non-issue. Applying a proper fix quickly to operational systems is hard and so we need, a, we need to appreciate there's a middle ground needed. With all these software parts and configurations moving around aircraft and ground systems, how do we know we can trust their integrity? Being able to verify the data leads to more complexity and reliance on our suppliers. When, uh, what happens when one of these suppliers is affected by their own cyber incident? How does an airline know a vendor is managing their own cyber security properly? Our team's goal is to review the cybersecurity of all of our vendors, but this is a massive undertaking that needs to be resourced properly. I mentioned regulations earlier. Airline use of operational systems now overlaps with corporate environments. We access aircraft ground systems and receive parts on more of these generic IT type systems. Combined with increased connectivity and we find measuring compliance much harder and more complex. More options create more questions. An appropriate a phrase to try and cover so many of these questions is one that our CEO uses. How do we know we're safe and what do we do if we're not? And I'll hand over to Sharn. Thanks, Sharn. Um, thank you, Mike. So how did two business units of an airline who had minimal crossover pre-pandemic come together in this digitally accelerated environment? How was this achieved during a pandemic when operational constraints were in place, cyber attacks on the aviation industry are on the rise, and new digitally specific regulations were released? The first step was to bridge the gap between the cyber team and the aircraft operations team. At the core of any relationship is trust. To build trust, cyber first had to remove inefficient processes and complications that impeded the operational teams when dealing with cyber. Reduced flight schedules freed up senior operational personnel, which allowed them to have in-depth conversations with the cyber team, focused directly on the issues that affected them when working with us. The feedback was highly valuable and enabled cyber to identify resourcing constraints and create a roadmap of improvements to our processes. The aim for cyber is to be trusted advisors as part of routine operational functions. We don't want to be seen as a barrier to digital acceleration in the aircraft operations space. One of the complaints from operations was that they were having to re-explain the complexities and restrictions of their environment to cyber because they didn't have a dedicated resource assigned to them. This wasted time for the operations team and slowed the delivery of their projects, processes, improvements, and applications as well as occasionally affecting OTP. We were, all, uh, we were able to resolve this by appointing dedicated cyber advisors to work solely in the operational space to act as the operational to digital translator. This advisor role requires an adaptable approach from cyber professionals because it is challenging to apply the latest security frameworks and technology to aircraft operations. Additional cyber considerations in this space include the use of legacy technology, regulatory obligations, vendor-specific technology and the appropriate security guidelines and processes, and the, and the wide variety of fleets and the age of fleets. By developing relationships with operations, our cyber advisors can now clearly understand these complexities. We have been able to normalize conversations which then enables operations to digest key information in advance, allowing them to provide constructive feedback to cyber 
on digital changes that would otherwise impact the operational environment. This approach is a great fit for our new working environment because this decision was made at an organization level to become a digital airline. Next slide, please. Becoming a digital airline. This strategy has enabled the formalization of cross-functional teams. Integrating team members who had already worked together added further efficiency to delivery of projects and initiatives in the operational space. It has allowed the cyber team to overcome historical viewpoints and back operational initiatives because of a greater understanding of the environment and the restrictions surrounding it. And it's recognized that the cyber team members require a dual mindset for both cyber and aircraft operations for the implementation of new and reliable technology. One of the outcomes for the cyber team is that security assurance tested, uh, testing is now conducted on new and existing digital platforms in the operational environment. This is standard practice in the corporate IT space, but was really performed for projects in the operational space because of the lack of trust that existed between the two teams. Now, so now cyber is trusted to engage directly with vendors to scope security assurance testing, which improves the security of the operational environment and the products that run in it, as well as the industry as a whole, as these fixes to these problems are rolled out. The aircraft operations team have benefited from having early visibility in cyber changes. A success story is the recent rollout of USB restrictions across the organization. Understandably, there were concerns about the effect this would have on the operational environment, given the reliance on USB for a variety of critical operational processes. With the trust built between the teams that the environmental change will go as planned and that the operational team has been fully consulted, the rollout process was implemented with no operational issues at all. So what's next? Next slide, please. We want to keep doing what we are doing. Through the relationships we have built and the new way of working that we have adopted, we are now involved early and often in the discussion about the adoption of new ideas and platforms in the aircraft operations space. The teams are delivering cyber initiatives and operation initiatives in a timely manner and seeing positive results. This continues to improve and build relationships between aircraft operational areas and cyber and assisting the business to recover and thrive in a post-pandemic world. The challenges we have faced will not just be ours alone. These challenges are faced across the avian industry and we're keen to learn how others have faced and overcome these challenges. Next slide, please. Namihi which is Māori for thank you. And thank you to Ayata for allowing Mike and I to provide this presentation. Wonderful, thank you, Sean. Well, um, I wish we had a little bit more time for question. I, I would ask you a ton of questions because um, everybody's asking themselves, why should we care about the hypersecurity of operational data? Who Who is interested into hacking them or, or uh, uh, forging them or anything? Anyways, I'll keep that and hopefully we'll have another session and I'll make sure you guys are not staying <laughs> at 4 a.m. there. So with that, I would like to uh, thank uh, to all our presenters uh, also for staying with us till the end of the webinar. I would like also to thank all the attendees for sticking with us as well. Um, just a, a few notes before I let you go. I know that we are going a little bit over the time. Uh, at the end of this webinar, uh, after this webinar, we will send you one email. In that email, you will find either the link or the file with all the presentations. And you will also find the link to the recording of this webinar. And you will also have an email address where you get, can uh, forward your questions if you have any. Other than that, please type in digital aircraft operations in your Google or any browser and you will find our page uh, on IATA website and that will have you will, will give you a good uh, connection point with uh, with us for any other uh, 
inquiries. With that, I would like to wish you the good rest of your day, wherever you are. Thank you very much for uh, attending this webinar, and hopefully we'll see you in the future with the other topics and series. Thank you very much, and have a good day. Bye.